Good morning, everyone. My name is Peter Doman. I'm a solicitor at Matthews Holbig Lawyers in Parramatta. I want to thank you for joining me today to discuss the art of drafting employment agreements, uh, a sword and a shield for employers. Now, the presentation I want to give today um, is quite detail rich. Uh, apologies if it gets a bit dry at times. I figured it'd be better to give you a bit more information than less. Um, the way I wish to uh, give the presentation is as follows. Firstly, I want to give a bit of an introduction as to why is employment agreements, or what are they, what do we consider to be employment agreements, what makes up an employment agreement, um, the do's and don'ts of drafting employment agreements, and then we'll get into what we consider to be the standard or essential employment terms that would cover about 95% of your typical employment agreements. Um, obviously, you can have additional terms depending on the circumstances, but these are what we consider the must-haves or certainly the must-considers. Um, that will be in the form of a, a list presentation, so feel free to take some notes if you wish, um, uh, or else compare to any employment agreements you have um, in force at your business um, as I go. Uh, once we go through those standard employment terms, um, I'll deal with some additional considerations and additional terms for award-covered employees. So that could apply to employees who are covered by an award or else employees of you as the employer who are also covered by an award because of the industry in which you operate. Um, then I'll deal with um, three contractual terms which provide substantial benefits and protections to employers. Those are basically uh, confidential information terms, intellectual property terms and restraints. And finally, I'll provide you with um, a few uh, examples of benefits of having well-prepared employment agreements, as well as some case studies that will give you some, uh, give you some uh, real-world real examples. So let's begin. Why use an employment agreement? Well, there are a lot of reasons, uh, but the main three that we see are as follows. Firstly, to ensure consistency and compliance with the Fair Work Act, the National Employment Standards, which are contained within the Fair Work Act, but also stand, um, stand for themselves, as well as any applicable modern award. Uh, employment agreements protect your business via certain terms, uh, the confidential information, intellectual property and restraint clauses, and express and detailed and clear employment agreements uh, minimise exposure to employment disputes, um, claims involving implied terms, as well as misrepresentation claims. Um, there are other benefits and protections which I'll get into at the end of the presentation. So what makes up an employment agreement? What do I mean when I refer to an employment agreement? So obviously an employment agreement can be the express contract itself. Um, it could include any annexures and schedules which you consider to be appropriate, um, but don't consider necessary or, or uh, appropriate to include in the, the main body of the contract. It could include a separate letter of offer which provides either a summary of those terms or uh, a general overview uh, which is followed up by a separate standard terms and conditions document. Uh, and it could also contain um, separate documents such as confidentiality deeds, intellectual property deeds and non-competition deeds. Those first two, the confidential information and IP deeds, are relevant where you wish to protect uh, important intellectual property or trade secrets um, uh, unique to your industry or your operations, and the latter, the non-competitions, where uh, you believe that the employee will have significant access, uh, front-facing access to clients, or will be um, attributed to, uh, will have um, be the cause for a substantial amount of the goodwill um, for the business. Uh, so that will avoid. Um, unfair competition if and when the employee decides to leave. So what should you do when drafting an employment agreement? Uh, these are what we consider the first steps. Step one, absolutely essential, is to uh, identify and review any applicable modern award. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to assume that your business and enterprise is not covered by and you don't have in place an, industrial, uh, um, an enterprise agreement. Um, if you do, some of the... Um, uh, information here may be a little bit um, uh, superfluous because obviously the enterprise agreement will contain a lot of these terms already. But if um, the awards speak for themselves um, and apply regardless of whether you agree to them or not, so uh, make sure you ensure, ensure that you um, identify the applicable award, if there is one, and be familiar with its terms. Uh, consider the specific conditions and requirements of the employment. 
obviously the, the nature of the role the employee is going to perform. Um, be careful of cutting and pasting. Don't rely simply on finding a template contract off the internet or bringing one in from a former employer um, or using one that was prepared several years ago. Um, you'll often find that they contain um, out-of-date terms, references to legislation that are no longer in force or have been repealed, uh, or uh, may get you into more trouble because it actually contains terms you uh, expressly don't want. So um, make sure that you prepare the agreement based on the terms and conditions and requirements you need at the time. Um, make sure it's easy to understand for both yourself and the employee. Uh, in the event of um, uncertainty or disputes over the meaning of certain terms, most of the time a court will find in the favour of the party not drafting the uh, employment agreement. So you want to give yourself uh, all opportunities to ensure that um, the terms are clear and to the, the fullest extent possible in your favour. Feel free to include self-serving statements, uh, statements that reflect what, um, you going, what you're going to do, what the employee has to do, and uh, benefits or uh, legal conclusions that uh, would benefit you. Um, if they're not enforceable, so be it, but um, it doesn't help to have them in there in the first place. And uh, finally, and most, I think most importantly, certainly from our point of view, is get legal advice. Uh, get a one, over, a one hour once over of the agreement that you prepared. Um, even if you've done it yourself, a quick review um, and minor adjustment may save you hours and hours and thousands of dollars worth of headaches and legal costs. So, what should you avoid when drafting an employment agreement? Firstly, ensure that the terms aren't cons inconsistent with any modern award that applies to the employee. Make sure it doesn't, uh, it's not inconsistent with any enterprise agreement and any applicable legislation. Obviously, the Fair Work Act is the main one, but it could include work health and safety legislations, uh, le legislation. Ensure it doesn't contain uh, discriminatory or, or prohibited terms, so ensure that it doesn't contain terms that um, contravene uh, anti-discrimination law, for example. Um, I, we would recommend that any policies or procedures um, that you have in place not be part of the agreement. They should be separate documents. Um, the reason for that, um, I will explain the reason for that later on in the presentation, uh, but su suffice it to say that you don't want um, your policies uh, giving rise to a, an enforceable contractual obligation um, and potential breaches for not complying with operational policies you might have in place. Uh, ensure that any offer of employment and the terms of the negotiation for employment uh, don't involve co uh, coercion or duress. Uh, any evidence of that may result in a contract being unenforceable. Uh, it goes without saying, but don't attempt to contract out of the national employment stands, either expressly or impliedly. Uh, the NES stands uh, speaks for itself and applies whether you agree with it or not. And avoid promissory statements. So avoid things that say that the employee will attempt to do this or take all reasonable steps to do that. Um, contracts should be clear and unequivocal and um, to the fullest extent um, drafted in your favour. So here we get to the, the meat of the presentation, which are what we consider the main terms to include in a contract or an employment agreement. Um, I'll go through these as, as quickly as I can. Um, if anyone wants to rely on these um, um, uh, dot points or these notes, uh, you're obviously welcome to contact us for the presentation um, after I conclude and we'd be happy to provide these to you. Um, but in essence, these are what we recommend you include. Firstly, include the type of the employment. Specify whether it's a full-time or part-time permanent role, whether it's a casual role, and be aware that casual and permanent are different. Um, obviously, permanent, part-time, uh, permanent full-time and permanent part-time is one category of employment. Casual is another, and where um, uh, there's no overlap. A lot of employers actually don't quite understand that, and I could spend a full hour dealing with that, but suffice it to say, if you're a permanent employee, you'll either be full-time or part-time, or you'll be a casual employee. There are separate categories as well, such as a fixed term, where the employment period is specified and uh, subject to a reputatory breach by a party uh, will continue for the duration of that term. Separate to that is a maximum duration contract, which applies in the same way, but includes a right of termination by either one or both of those parties. And finally, you may have a need to provide a contract um, for a uh, parental leave or other replacement. Next, include um, the name of the position or role that the employee will uh, fill and perform. 
and include a brief description of the inherent requirements of that role. And bullet points are fine. You don't need to go into great detail, especially if you're going to have a separate job description that you're providing either as an annexure or separately some, sometime later down the line. The employment contract should specify the commencement date for the employment. Uh, that obviously makes sense if it's a new employee. If the employee, if it's an existing employee receiving a new and updated employment agreement, um, it would be helpful to include both the effective start date uh, for the employee when they started uh, employment originally, as well as a commencement date for the new agreement. Next, set out a, a list of the duties um, and the responsibilities that the employee will have to perform. Firstly, list the primary and essential duties, those being the duties required specifically by the position, was, uh, uh, the position or the job concerned, as well as uh, a list of the inherent duties uh, applicable to the employment. Those include uh, the obligation, the duty to act in the employer's best interest, to act in a professional manner, and to comply with all reasonable and lawful directions of the employer. Um, also include provision uh, to require the employee to perform ancillary or related duties, uh, those outside the express duties listed. If the employer or if your business is part of a group of companies or the employee will be performing duties on behalf of a third party, specify the obligation to perform duties uh, for that third party. And finally, it's important to uh, make reference to the right of the employer to uh, amend the duties listed for operational reasons, which may include uh, workplace change or promotions. Next term to include would be, uh, we recommend would be working hours. So obviously start, uh, specify the nominal start and finish time. Uh, feel free to include self-serving statements regarding the right or the obligation of the employer to work reasonable additional hours. Um, that obviously is subject to the imposition of overtime unless there's an annualised salary. Um, consider if there's likely to be significant overtime worked, uh, whether an award applies and whether that award has any provisions relating to a maximum hours of work. A lot of them do. Um, some, um, some awards also include uh, provisions allowing for the averaging of hours so that um, an employee may go over maximum hours or specified hours in one week, provided the average over a, for example, a four-week period uh, isn't exceeded. Um, have, a, have, have regard to possible need to work on public holidays and if... Um, if it's appropriate, specify that the employee may only work overtime by agreement and that will avoid the risk of underpayment claims um, where an employee alleges significant overtime worked uh, without uh, authorisation or um, uh, acquiescence by the employer. Next, consider including a exclusivity clause. That is where um, you require an employee to uh, dedicate all of his or her working hours to you as the employer. Uh, if you don't wish to include such a, a term and it's a bit unreasonable to include one for a casual or, or a part-time employee, um, you may wish to consider including a requirement that the employee uh, disclose um, any uh, employment or engagement by a third party uh, and requiring the employer to um, approve of that third party work. Um, and you can also require the employee to ensure that any third-party work uh, is not, uh, does not give rise to an, either an actual or a potential conflict of interest with the employer. Next, include a location of work provision. Um, obviously, um, that would specify uh, the primary place of work, the primary location. That would either be an office or a work site. Um, but it may include alternative offices, so allow for flexibility if, if appropriate. Um, if the job requires interstate or international travel, make sure that's specified at, at upfront, and um, you may wish to make reference to the obligation to perform reasonable interstate travel. Um, reasonable is always one of those terms that is hard to define in these sort of contexts, but it will depend on the, on the circumstances. Obviously, a commercial sales employee performing um, sales rep work would expect and would be obliged to perform significant travel duties whether or not it's interstate or international will depend on the circumstances. Um, if there is travel work, um, consider whether that extra travel will be subject to additional remuneration. If not, make sure it's specified that um, there's no additional pay for the travel time. Um, consider whether you wish to add a meal break term. Uh, 
Awards may specify the type and the length of the break. Um, if there's no award applying, then the right to a meal break is purely contractual, although it goes without saying that employees working eight hours a day should be entitled to a meal break or a rest break of some form. These usually range between half an hour to an hour. Um, if you're inserting such a term, consider the operational requirements of, of your business, for example, uh, where uh, if you're involved in production, if everyone takes a break at the same time, obviously that will interfere with the production line. So ensure that there are breaks taken at a reasonable time or staggered uh, or by agreement. Now, the next one is, is a bit of a thorny one. Um, some industrial, uh, some enterprise agreements, sorry, some modern awards um, require you to specify um, that, that the employee uh, is covered by the award. Um, so if the award uh, requires you to, to state in writing that the employee is covered by that award, um, make sure that's listed in the um, employment agreement and ensure that otherwise any term of the, uh, of the uh, agreement is not inconsistent with the um, modern award. Uh, if there are inconsistencies, um, then ensure that those inconsistencies are on the more favourable side for the employee and you can specify that any inconsistency um, between the industrial instrument and the contract, the more favourable conditions will apply. Um, the next one is also a bit of a thorny one, uh, the minimum employment period. This used to be known as the probationary period. Um, you may wish to consider it, uh, to include it or not to include it. Uh, we tend not to because it now has statutory force under the Fair Work Act and it really only has relevance for unfair dismissal rights. Um, if an employee has been employed for less than six months, that employee is not entitled to an unfair dismissal claim unless the employee is employed by a small business employer with less than 15 employees, uh, then that minimum employment period goes from six months to 12 months. Uh, those provisions speak for themselves and anything you put in a contract regarding a probationary period is irrelevant for the purpose of that test. Um, however, the minimum, minimum employment period may be helpful uh, if you wish to impose a shorter notice period for the first year. For example, if the contract has a set notice of termination clause for one month, um, but you wish to have a six-month probationary period where the notice period is one week, which is obviously in accordance with the National Employment Standards for notice of termination. Uh, otherwise, uh, we tend not to include them unless uh, specifically requested. Um, it's ultimately up to you. Uh, next, um, include a fundamental requirements clause if it's appropriate. Um, if the employee is required to have certain qualifications, licences, degrees, a motor vehicle, certain supplies or equipment with, with him or her, make sure that's stated in the agreement. Uh, we usually have a fundamental requirements clause and refer it to um, any specific requirements within the schedule. Next, um, we strongly recommend you have a work health and safety clause, which sets out the employee's obligations and duties are under the Work Health and Safety Act. Um, they mainly are the requirement to perform work safely and the requirement on the obligation of the employee to comply with any directions issued by the employer uh, for a work health and safety purpose. Uh, you may wish to also include um, the implications or the results if that, uh, those obligations are breached. If you do include a performance review clause, keep it brief, uh, allow flexibility. You don't wish to be um, uh, locked in contractually to the obligation to uh, provide uh, annual or semi-annual performance reviews and or pay increases. Um, you should have the flexibility to do that when the circumstances demand and require it. Um, another important term to include is a what we consider to be or what we call a continuity clause. Uh, that clause basically provides that any changes to the role, title, salary or responsibilities of the employee will be a, va a variation to the existing employment agreement and the balance of the agreement um, already in place, not affected by the variation, um, continues in force. Um, the reason for, or the, the importance of this clause is to avoid um, a implied uh, terms provision where an old employment agreement ceases to have, is argued to cease to have any effect and uh, the new employment agreement only contains bare bones terms. Um, I'll get into that in a bit more detail at the end of the presentation.
The next term, which obviously is very important for the employee, is the remuneration terms. Uh, firstly, set out the, the nature of the wage, the salary, the package that the employee is going to receive. It could be an hourly rate, it could be a weekly rate or an annualised salary. Um, also make reference to any, uh, obviously make reference to superannuation uh, rather than leaving that vague or uncertain. Um, specify that the superannuation was either um, inclusive or, or the, 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 the stated salary is either inclusive or exclusive of super. Um, if there are allowances, make reference to them. And if there are any applicable and agreed fringe benefits, uh, include them also. Uh, have regard to the fact that leave entitlements are paid at a base rate of pay under the Fair Work Act, so you may wish to consider um, expressly specifying what the base wage is so there can be no uncertainty as to how uh, leave entitlements are calculated. Uh, also set out the frequency of the pay, um, check conditions any applicable award. Some awards specify that employees must be paid no less frequency than weekly, um, but if there's no award that applies or the award is silent as to uh, frequency, then Section 323 of the Fair Work Act provides that pay must be at least monthly. Um, part of the remuneration may include bonuses and commissions. Um, consider whether you want this to be a contractual term or a separate policy. Uh, if it's a, uh, if it's a uh, discretionary bonus, then it should definitely be a separate policy. Make sure it's not a contractual obligation um, to provide a bonus if it's, uh, if it's um, discretionary. Uh, set out any conditions for the payment of those bonuses or commissions. For example, does the employee need to be employed at the time of the payment? Does the employee need to get to the end of a yearly period? And is payment only payable, the commission only payable, when the third party pays you as the employer? Um, make these clear and express so there could be no uncertainty or dispute over when, if and when commissions are payable. Uh, next, um, we strongly recommend you include a set-off or an annualised salary clause, especially if you have a an annual if you're paying an employee an annual package rather than a weekly wage. Um, a a set-off clause and annualised salary clause are useful for both um, reducing your payroll admin requirements. Uh, you don't have to follow and ensure that every little um, requirement of an award, for example, all applicable loadings or allowances or benefits are paid um, in the exact form required. You basically provide a lump sum that takes into account all benefits potentially payable under the award at any given time. And also, because for the same reason, minimise the risk of underpayment claims. If you ensure that the annual salary or the annualised salary is higher than anything that could be payable under the award, there can be no um, underpayment claim raised. Um, but do be careful. Um, some awards do contain annualised salary clauses, which impose, addi uh, impose additional requirements on you as the employer to um, include details in the, in the agreement. I'll get to this at, at, towards the end of the presentation. Include a deductions clause. Uh, that clause, uh, uh, such a clause would permit you as the employer to recover any inadvertent overpayments to the employee, whether by way of a, a deduction from subsequent payments uh, or else recovery uh, after, after employment ends. Uh, but have regard to Section 324 of the Fair Work Act for permitted deductions. There are certain requirements of what you can and cannot deduct, um, as well as requirements that Deductions only be for the employee's benefit. Um, for example, the deduction of union, wage, uh, union fees and union dues. Also check the conditions in the award. They may have additional obligations in there as well. And if there's anything within an award that requires you to specify, um, if there's anything within the award that requires specification, uh, make sure that's included as well. I'll get into this uh, later on in the presentation, so I won't deal with it right now. Next, um, this is a, uh, a bit of a contentious one, uh, certainly for myself, uh, the issue of leave. Um, the inclusion of leave terms obviously is, is a necessity in a certain degree, uh, in, in a sense, but the degree to which you set out what the leave benefits are for an employee is really ultimately up to you. Um, firstly, you might want to have regards to what leave you want to refer to in the agreement. Uh, the main forms of leave obviously are annual leave, paid personal care as leave, unpaid carers leave, long service leave, parental leave, both paid and unpaid, and compassionate leave, and community service leave, such as jury duty leave. Um, 
You don't have to make reference to all of these forms of leave. You may only wish to include the main ones, annual leave, paid personal and long service leave. Um, but when making reference to these forms of leave, include the internal rules or guidances or guidance or requirements you wish to impose for the taking of that leave. For example, um, the obligation to take leave during annual close downs or the requirement to um, provide uh, evidence substantiating um, sick leave upon the return, for example. Um, also have regard to any applicable uh, modern award because they do have um, several uh, uh, provisions relating specifically to uh, the cashing out or the direction to take leave uh, when it's excessive. Um, they should be fairly um, identifiable within the award. When it comes to specifying or, or including terms regarding personal leave, um, paid personal leave, um, we recommend avoiding uh, or else limiting the requirement to um, requiring the employee to um, provide evidence uh, substantiating the taking of the leave, for example, the provision of a, a medical certificate, only after two or more consecutive days. Um, don't make such a specification. Uh, don't make such a uh, don't include such a specification because you may wish to um, depart from it in certain circumstances. For example, if you don't, uh, if you have concerns over the legitimacy of certain forms of leave when an employee is taking what you believe to be an excessive amount, um, you may wish to include uh, also um, additional garden leave provisions. For example, um, uh, garden leave during a notice period where the employee is paid to sit at home and wait out a notice period. Uh, but otherwise, let the NES and the awards speak for itself. Um, as I said before, uh, the NES and the award have uh, specific requirements and rules, for example, in relation to cashing out, so you don't need to reinvent the wheel and, and transcribe all of these requirements. Uh, oh, and finally, remember too that casual employees are not entitled to paid annual or personal leave. Um, so to the extent that you include terms uh, for a casual employee, or leave, uh, it's sufficient to s simply say that, as for, for example, as a casual employer, you are not entitled to paid annual leave. Next, include a reference to policies. Uh, obviously, you would have certain operational um, policies in place, policies and procedures in place uh, at your business. So include a clause requiring the employee to at all times comply with any current or future policies of the employer. Include a self-serving statement that uh, states that the employer, uh, the, the policies are not binding on the employer, but do bind the employee. Um, the reason for this is you don't wish the policies to create new contractual obligations um, unless you specifically want them to. And ensure that the policies aren't inconsistent with the employment agreement or any other statutory obligations. The next, the next clause, and I think the big one, is the termination or the notice of termination provisions. Um, ensure that your contracts and your agreements include express notice per, uh, periods for both you as the employer, notice of termination, and the employee, notice of resignation. Ensure that the notice terms meet the minimum requirements both under the NES. Now, the NES, and specifically Section 117 of the Fair Work Act, uh, sets out the minimum period of notice required to be given by an employer, but an award um, sets out the minimum period of notice required to be given by the employee and the employer. Um, the main difference between the two, as a general rule, is that for an employer, when an employee is over 45 and has completed more than um, one, uh, two years of continuous service, that employee is entitled to an additional one week's uh, notice or payment in lieu of notice upon termination that he, would other, he or she would otherwise provide. But that doesn't apply when the employee is giving notice of resignation. For example, if an employee is over 45 and has performed more than two years of continuous service, that employee is not required to give the minimum period of notice plus one week. Now, the clause uh, as drafted will also depend on the type of employment. For example, a casual employee um, has no right of notice otherwise, uh, other than um, usually um, either one hour notice or, or specify that they're not entitled to notice and each uh, each period of employment terminates at the end of the, the period of engagement. Um, if it's a, um, a fixed, uh, fixed term agreement, uh, then there may be no um, termination clauses at all, or you may have a termination clause or a right of termination only for you as the employer, but not the employee. 
and include a separate provision um, entitling you to summarily terminate the employment uh, for misconduct. And you can set out examples of misconduct, for example, uh, theft, fraud, repeated non-compliance with the reasonable lawful directions, etc., uh, but also have regard to the definition of serious misconduct, which is set out in Regulation 107 of the Fair Work Regulations. It, it, uh, that reg essentially provides that I mean, serious misconduct has its ordinary meaning, but it includes a list of uh, a certain forms of uh, misconduct that constitutes serious misconduct. So you may be able to use that as a, as a starting point or a springboard for your definition. Now, you should also include a term that allows you as the employer to provide the employer with payment in lieu of notice rather than notice, so terminate the employment immediately and provide, for example, four weeks' pay. Um, if you include such a, a term, and we certainly recommend that you do, consider how the payment in lieu of notice should be calculated, whether it's on a package or on a base salary. Um, under uh, Section 117 of the Fair Work Act, any payment in lieu of notice uh, is paid at the full rate of pay. Um, that has a separate definition. So uh, you may wish to um, uh, defer to that and consider that any payment in lieu of notice will be on a on the full package, which will include obviously any allowances, benefits, bonuses, commissions, etc. Remember that any contractual right of termination in your employment agreement does not oust the employee's statutory protections. For example, simply complying with your contract, uh, terminating your, uh, an employee in accordance with the contract doesn't uh, avoid your any potential liability under unfair dismissal laws, adverse action or workers' comp compensation laws. And um, except where the employee is a casual, ensure that any notice of termination given is provided in writing. When, if and when you are terminating an employee, and obviously this has less to do with the agreement itself, but more so to do with the event, but when you do uh, terminate an employee, consider uh, the ramifications of the termination. The employee may have a, a vehicle or be issued with uh, work equipment, and consider whether the employee will be entitled to retain that during any period of notice or be obliged to return them. Consider also the status of any shares uh, or office holdings, um, any lodging that the employee has. So, for example, if an employee's package includes lodging or accommodation, um, providing that employee with uh, notice of termination, uh, sorry, payment in lieu of notice, uh, rather than uh, notice of termination, may be uh, somewhat procedurally unfair. Um, so have regard to the, the rights or the, the circumstances of the employee when you terminate. Finally, be aware of... Uh, in the event of any termination for an employee subject to commission or bonus payments, uh, what that may do to the employee's uh, rights under those, um, those um, uh, commission structures. For example, terminating before a deadline uh, may waive, contractually waive the employee's rights to the commission, but is that fair or appropriate to do? Now, obviously, if you get uh, a termination wrong, there are some serious ramifications or consequences that can flow. There can be repudiation arguments, so breach of contract claims. You could have unfair dismissal claims or adverse action or discrimination claims. And uh, importantly, um, if, if there's a finding that you have breached as the employer uh, the terms of the contract by way of a repudiatory breach, you may lose the benefit every, of any post-employment obligations such as restraints or confidential information. So we would strongly recommend you seek legal advice prior to any dismissal uh, to minimise the risk and to discuss any options risk minimisation. Next, redundancy. Is there a policy? Do you have a separate policy in place? If not, simply rely on the NES. Uh, that's set out in Section 119 of the Fair Work Act. Consider whether you're going to pay, pay on a package or on the base salary. Under the Fair Work Act, redundancy pay is, is payable on the base rate of pay. Um, so uh, if you're making an express, simply just say that redundancy pay is paid on the base rate of pay or the base salary. Um, including any self-serving statements uh, you consider appropriate that, um, that states to the effect that unless the NES or award specifies, uh, no additional redundancy pay applies uh, to the employee in the event of redundancy. Um, however, note that there are certain exclusions and uh, carve-outs for the obligation to pay redundancy pay under Section 121 of the Fair Work Act. Namely, those are for employees employed for less than 12 months and casual employees who don't get redundancy pay. Um, also include a provision 
entitling you as the employer to direct an employee to uh, perform alternative duties or else suspend the employee uh, in certain circumstances. They may be, for example, for operational reasons, where there's a workplace investigation into misconduct, whether by that employee or otherwise, or for work health and safety issues, for example, to investigate um, a potentially unsafe um, piece of machinery or plant at the, at the workplace. Next, include these three essential clauses. I will deal with these uh, a bit later in the presentation, but be aware that these are the main protections for you as the employer. Confidential information, uh, protection of confidential information, uh, protection and assignment of intellectual property, which includes moral rights, and uh, the protection against competitive activity or solicitation or poaching of either your clients or your employees, which uh, collectively we consider to be the restraints or the restrictive covenants. Now, those restraints can apply either during the employment or following the employment, um, and I'll get into that in a bit more detail in, uh, in a moment. What other, clause, what other clause, uh, clauses uh, could you consider? Well, we would consider reimbursement of expenses clauses, for example, whether there's a requirement that the, employer, that the employee get approval before incurring any expenses, or else the terms and conditions of the issue of any company credit card, the issue of any company equipment and the obligations and the obligations to uh, keep the, the, the equipment in good order and return if directed, uh, fitness for work provisions, for example, the requirement of the employee to submit to drug or alcohol testing, either randomly or in certain circumstances, and the requirement of the employee to attend medical assessments. And this is a, uh, strongly recommended if the employee is performing um, either a highly stressful, emotionally stressful uh, role or else uh, physically taxing roles such as manufacturing. Um, if the employee is on a visa, include uh, appropriate provisions relating to uh, those visa conditions or the obligation of the employee to um, uh, ensure compliance with their visa conditions. Include definitions and interpretation uh, provisions such as um, uh, that, that defining certain terms within the, uh, within the agreement and uh, assisting in the interpretation of certain clauses. Um, other clauses such as severability clauses that allow that certain clauses or certain provisions within the agreement may be severed without affecting the, the enforceability or the validity of the balance of the agreement. Uh, waiver, which is where the failure by you to take certain steps immediately doesn't waive your right to do it at a later time. And entire agreement clause, which is where you say that um, any prior negotiations, uh, representations or uh, documentation uh, don't form part of the agreement and that the agreement um, must can only be um, modified in writing by both parties. Include a jurisdictional applicable law, essentially saying that the, the, the agreement will be interpreted, interpreted in accordance with the laws of New South Wales or wherever you're based and uh, the parties submit to the jurisdiction of the court in that state. Um, you may wish to consider any other clauses that may um, specifically relate to the nature of the engagement or the nature of the duties, uh, but they're the main ones that we consider um, the, the overflow provisions. Finally, um, we tend to draft agreements where we have a fairly stock standard um, main body, the contract itself, and the variables go in the schedule. So the, sh the variables could include the detail of the employee, also the detail of the employer if it's appropriate, the position and the role, the name of the role, the commencement date, as well as any effective employment dates, which that's separate, uh, setting out the salary or the hourly rate of pay, the working days and hours, as well as any other appropriate um, uh, variables such as um, essential terms, uh, fundamental requirements such as the, the, the holding and the retention of a driver's licence. You may wish to include separate annexures, for example, a separate position description or a commission structure, provided that that is you're prepared to have that as a contractual right rather than a policy. And finally, don't forget the Fair Work Information Statement, which is available online at the Fair Work Ombudsman site. That, that Fair Work Information Statement has to be provided to um, all new employees. So there are the employment terms. Uh, it was uh, a bit of a, a list. Um, I hope you could follow along with me okay with that. Um, I want to get into a few additional considerations for award employees, award covered employees. Um, and obviously this will have more limited re relevance if you're in an industry that uh, traditionally isn't award regulated, for example, the legal profession um, or, or, or uh, where you're dealing with professionals. Um, so firstly, 
consider the classification provisions um, as a first step, as, as set out earlier, determine what award, if any, covers the employee. And to do this, you could get the uh, assistance of the Fair Work Ombudsman or else contact us for legal advice. And in reviewing the award, consider whether the employees are required by you as the employer to be advised in writing their classification. Now, for example, the Manufacturing and Associated Industries Award 2010 only requires part-time employees to be advised in writing the award classification, but not full-time. Um, so that's a bit of a, a trick, but there are equally unusual terms in other, uh, other awards. So make sure that you're aware of your obligation to uh, identify and specify in writing any classifications um, under the award that applies to the employee. Um, consider including a reference to the award and the classification in either employment contract or the schedule. Uh, and if it's in the contract, uh, you'll need to amend this if the employee's classification changes. For example, if they perform a substantially different role, going from admin role to manufacturing role, for example, or if they get a promotion and they go to the next classification up. Um, if not in the employment agreement, make sure it's separately documented, for example, in a salary letter uh, or, a, uh, or a promotion letter. Next, um, in relation to annual salary provisions, now I dealt with this briefly uh, in uh, earlier, uh, annualised salary provisions and annual sal annualised salary clauses allow you as the employer to pay a, a lump sum annual salary to an employee in satisfaction of certain award entitlements. And those entitlements usually, uh, consist, usually consist of minimum weekly wages, uh, allowances, overtimes and penalty rates, and loadings, including annual leave loading. Um, now, have regard to the award uh, that covers your employees, because uh, certain awards uh, require you to specify in writing um, the, uh, the, the provisions or the entitlements within the award that are um, subject to the annual, annualised salary. Um, they must be in writing, as I said, and uh, you should reconcile, you should perform as, as, as regularly as possible. You should attempt to reconcile the amounts paid to the employee under the annualised salary against the payments the employee would have received under the award uh, if paid individually. Now, we'd recommend you take this assessment, undertake this assessment at least one time per year, um, in particular after any award pay adjustments, um, but preferably on a regular basis. So the, the takeaway is, is assess what the employee is receiving as an annualised salary lump sum compared to what the employee would get if paid um, purely in accordance with the award at the minimum rate of pay for the classification and subject to any applicable uh, overtime, penalty rates for weekend work, allowances, loadings, etc. And it, obviously if the, uh, the benefits under the award are higher, then you'll need to bump up that um, annualised salary um, as soon as possible. Now, I mentioned before that annualised salary clauses have to be in writing, and the reason for that is this. Um, I refer to the, the decision of Stewart and Next Residential, Proprietary Limited. Now, this is a Western Australia uh, a decision of the uh, Industrial Relations Commission of Western Australia. It was last year, uh, but it has um, um, put, put the fear of God almost in, in a lot of employers because um, it shows that or it, or it suggests that any administrative failure to properly document the annual salary may still expose you to an underpayment claim. So just briefly, um, Simone Stewart was employed by Next Residential as an administrative coordinator pursuant to a written agreement, and that agreement had a cont a contained an annualised salary clause. Now, that clause was in a very general form and said no more than the salary was inclusive of any award provisions or entitlements that may be payable under the award. It didn't specify the award in question and it didn't set out what award provisions were covered by the annualised salary. Now, the employer was covered by the Clark's Private Sector Award 2007, 2010, which contained um, specific annualised salary requirements, which A, required the employer to specify in writing which provision of the award will be satisfied by the annualised salary, and two, to specify the award itself. Now, even though that uh, Simone Stewart um, was paid an annualised salary, she claimed in her underpayment claim that she worked extensive overtime and was required to work during her unpaid lunch breaks. And as a result of these, uh, claimed an additional $30,000 in um, underpayments despite receiving that annualised salary. Now, the Commission in, in this case found that the 
contract was uncertain, that particular clause did not identify the applicable award as required by the award, and failed to com- uh, also failed to comply um, with the requirement to uh, set out the specific um, entitlements under the award that would be covered by the annualised salary. Now, it wasn't a final hearing. It was basically an, a, a, an interlocutory proceeding whereby the respondents sought to have the proceedings dismissed, um, but the, court fa- the, the, the Commission found that she could proceed with her claim um, and that the, uh, the clause in the agreement uh, did not oust her underpayment claim. It appears that the parties have settled because the matter hasn't gone any further, but the principle remains the same. Um, if you don't set out in detail, in writing, uh, the, um, in respect of the NUI salary clause, what provisions or what benefits are covered by that NUI salary clause, uh, then you may face a similar underpayment claim. So next, we'll get into those three essential um, protective uh, provisions, firstly, confidential, confidential information, intellectual property, and restraints. Now, what are the source of these obligations? Um, firstly, the employment contract, which is where we're suggesting today that you um, uh, include these uh, provisions. Uh, you could include them in a separate deed. Um, I think that's unnecessary unless the employment agreement, uh, the employee is already employed and you just want to um, bind the employer to a separate document. You could include it in company policies, but that is obviously more risky and harder to enforce. But also be aware that some of these obligations are implied by law. For example, there is the, uh, the implied, uh, uh, at, at common law, an employee is, is um, obliged to maintain and not misuse any confidential information obtained in the course of employment. And finally, uh, be aware that the Corporations Act also contains specific statutory obligations to a similar effect. Now, the Corporations Act, um, uh, I'll, get it, I'll get into that in a moment, actually. I'll get back to that. So we'll start with confidential information. Um, now, what is confidential information? It, it is usually fairly self-evident, but in essence, confidential information is information belonging to you as the employer regarding your business, operations, finance and commercial relationships, which is not in the public domain and is, is information you don't want getting out in the public domain. It obviously includes things like trade secrets and personal information. Um, personal information could, be, could include the information of your customers, uh, which is very important if you are a service provider in the health industry or the disability industry, but also could be the personal information of your employees. It excludes uh, information derived through acquired skill of the employee, information empl- uh, obtained by the employee from another source, for example, a former employer, uh, or information that's already in the public domain. And we recommend that when you include a confidential information clause that you list specific examples of the confidential information of yours that you wish to have protected. Um, you should also specify the remedies, re- the remedies you are entitled to, uh, to pursue for any breaches of the obligation. That could obviously include termination of employment if the employee breaches the obligation whilst employed. Uh, also injunctive relief uh, to restrain the employee from uh, further misusing any confidential information uh, in, a, in a way that um, does not benefit you or, or uh, is disadvantageous to you. You could seek damages for breach. Uh, for example, if confidential information has caused you to suffer a, uh, a concrete and a, 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 a realisable or, or uh, clear uh, form of economic loss, you can sue for the economic loss involved. You could also include in the, uh, the term a liquidation, liquidated damages clause. Now, that clause is one that essentially provides that uh, in the event of any breach, um, the employer assesses that the, 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 the damages flowing for the breach will be in the order of X thousand dollars and that you, uh, as the employer, submit to a, a demand or, or agree to uh, pay that amount in the event of any found breach. Be aware that any liquidated damages clause must be a genuine pre-estimate of the loss likely to be suffered. Make sure it uh, does not appear as a penalty clause. Uh, any penalty clause uh, in an agreement is uh, unenforceable by law. So if it's a, simply a, um, a monetary penalty imposed for a breach that has no reference or relation to the likely economic loss, then a court might find it to be a penalty and find it unenforceable. Um, Next, mention that uh, the employee is in, required to indemnify the employer 
for any legal costs arising as a consequence of pursuing that breach. And also specify that the obligations uh, under the confidential information clause uh, survive the termination of employment. So what safeguards do you have in place? You should, you should, you should consider this uh, when um, preparing the agreement. How are you protecting the information? Do you have uh, administrative or um, uh, technological safeguards in place? Do you have firewalls? Do you have um, do you conduct uh, video? Do you have computer surveillance and monitoring? Um, so consider that when you're setting out the terms in the agreement, um, and make reference to those if necessary. For example, you may need to um, disclose any surveillance being conducted within the workplace. Such as uh, computer surveillance, uh, it may be worth including that in the agreement um, expressly. Uh, consider whether the confidential information provisions cover or should extend to third parties. For example, if you have non-disclosure agreements uh, with clients, or you hold uh, commercially sensitive information on behalf on behalf of a third party, then ensure that the confidential information clause and specifically the definitions includes any third party uh, information that you're holding on behalf of that third party, which is by its nature or else expressly defined as confidential. Um, rely on what we consider the double barrel shotgun, which is the contract, contractual protection, which is that clause, which we're um, discussing now, but also the statutory protection under the Corporations Act. And um, under section 182 and 183 of the Corporations Act, it prohibits a a director, a secretary, other officer or employee of uh, improperly misusing their position to either gain an advantage for themselves or someone else or cause detriment to the corporation. And 183 specific in, in, in particular um, provides that a person who obtains information because they are or have been a director or other officer or employee of the corporation must not improperly use the information to gain an advantage for themselves or someone else or cause detriment to the corporation. And the note under Section 183 confirms that that duty continues after the termination of the employee or the officer. So that's a statutory obligation to protect and not misuse to the detriment of the employer, the employer, the confidential information of that employer. Next, um, include a intellectual property clause. Uh, these are quite complex and can be um, a little bit uh, opaque to prepare. So you might actually. Uh, if, if in the event that you do have significant intellectual property you wish to protect, uh, you may wish to uh, get some assistant, legal assistance for the drafting of intellectual property clauses. But in, in essence, what these clauses do is provide an express contractual right uh, for you uh, as the employer rather than simply relying on the protection of the Copyright Act. Uh, the intellectual property clauses should require the employee to assign the ownership of any inventions and works made by the employee during the employment uh, to you as the employer or, or the, the, the license holder. Uh, it also includes, you should also include an obligation um, that the employee disclose any new inventions or works um, um, created during the period of employment. So you're not surprised by something being created by a, a newly departed employee uh, that clearly arose during the, the, the period of that employee's employment. Um, Consider whether the provisions deal with inventions or works brought by the employee. So should there be carve-outs for uh, IP brought to you by the employee? And uh, procedural fairness or fairness would suggest that there should be, but there may be some need for negotiations around that. And consider whether the provisions extend to inventions and works created by the employee but outside working hours. So does the mere fact that the employee is employed by you uh, give you dominion over any inventions or works made by an employee even on their own time. And arguably this would be a harder one to enforce or certainly have uh, agreed to, uh, but it may be where you can show that the inventions of works were created using the employers, using your company property. That may uh, provide a sufficient nexus for you to claim uh, ownership over those inventions of works. And finally, uh, and I think probably most important of the three, are restraints. Now restraints are... Uh, uh, prohibit certain, certain forms of activities by employees, either during employment or following employment. Uh, the restraints are designed to protect either the goodwill of the, the business, being the, the, the clients and the employees, 
against poaching or solicitation and is designed to protect the business against unfair competition, which obviously arises after the employee has uh, departed or resigned or, or their employment is terminated for whatever reason. Now, restraints should only extend so far as to reasonably protect the employer's commercial interests. It should not be uh, unreasonable, it should not be oppressive, and obviously those sort of factors are going to be, various factors are going to be taken into account by a court if, in the event of a dispute over uh, the enforceability of a post-employment restraint. Um, in order to uh, have a restraint enforceable, there must be consideration paid for it, so there must be something of value given up or given to the employee in exchange for the restraint. Um, so this could obviously be part of a remuneration package at the time of commencing employment, or else a separate pay rise, or a sign-on bonus, um, or additional one-off bonus if you're um, uh, signing the employee up to a separate restraint under a separate deed. Um, include a payback clause if the restraints are, for whatever reason, held to be unenforceable by a court. Now, when drafting uh, restraints, um, as I said before, if they're found to be unenforceable or un uh, if they're found to be unreasonable or excessive or onerous, um, then they will be held to be unenforceable by a court. So to deal with this, consider drafting them in a, in a cascading way. Um, cascading provisions um, are generally done in the following way, where you have um, uh, uh, provisions drafted uh, that cover a specific area. So, for example... An employee must not engage in certain forms of activities within the country of Australia or the state of New South Wales or, for example, 25 kilometres from the main office and the employee cannot engage in that prohibited conduct for a period of 12 months or 6 months or 3 months, um, as well as the employee cannot perform, uh, engage in certain forms of activities which uh, reduce in severity or, or um, impact um, uh, in a, des in a de uh, descending way. The, the reason for cascading restraints is if um, a court finds that the most, the highest level of restraint is unenforceable, then it doesn't invalidate the entire restraint. It basically um, allows the employer, it, it allows the court to strike out the the unreasonable portion of the restraint, but allow the 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 lesser and more reasonable parts of the restraint to apply um, and and be enforceable. So the restraint should take into account the, the, the length of the employee's service, uh, the employee's seniority, the duties and the type of industry worked in. For example, an employee uh, who is a, a, a menial, uh, an employee who is a, uh, an admin or a clerical employee um, should not be subject to the same sort of restraints as a senior product manager or a senior sales manager who has a lot of uh, front-facing dealings with clients and access to confidential information. Remember too that there's no guarantee uh, that uh, restraints will be enforceable or held to be valid. In the same way, you should specify the remedies for any breaches, obviously termination of employment if the, the breach occurred during employment, uh, injunctive relief, so seeking an um, injunction or other, other form of interlocutory um, relief uh, to prevent further breaches, ensure that any injunctive relief is, is pursued urgently, uh, set out that any breaches could give rise to a claim of damages, and again, have uh, consider whether you want to include a separate liquidated damages clause, um, subject to the same conditions that it's not be a penalty, and specify that any um, breach, uh, that, uh, that employer, the employee um, uh, may be obliged to indemnify the employer for any legal costs arising in pursuing the breach. Uh, ensure the terms are severable so that the enforceability of certain provisions of the restraint do not invalidate the entire clause or else the entire uh, employment agreement in total. And again, specify that the obligations under the restraint survive the termination of employment. The common misconceptions about these provisions uh, don't assume that courts will automatically uphold them or consider them to be reasonable. Don't assume that they're easy to enforce. They are difficult, they are slow and they are very costly to enforce. Don't assume that um, a court can imply at law uh, post-employment restraints in the, express, in the absence of express contractual provisions. And don't assume that a confidential information clause has the same effect or else can imply the existence of post-employment restraints. Each um, protection, each clause speaks for itself and it's best to have them 
uh, expressly set out and prepared in a way that's careful and deals with um, your specific requirements regarding um, your information, your intellectual property, and uh, the goodwill you, you wish to protect. Now, what are the benefits of the employment agreements? Firstly, uh, having express employment agreements uh, minimises disputes. It ensures both parties are clear about their contractual obligations um, and minimises disputes over things such as the duties and responsibilities required to be performed, remuneration and pay, including commission, performance and pay reviews, suspension or alternative duties, termination and notice periods, and the enforceability of post-employment restraints. So obviously, having these all set out in writing expressly in a, a clear and uncertain way reduces the risk of any contract claims or underpayment claims um, that the employee may bring either during or following employment. What else do employment agreements uh, give you as a benefit? Well, it avoids the implication of reasonable notice terms. Now, um, you may or may not be aware that in the absence of an express term of notice, uh, a court may imply into any employment agreement a term of reasonable notice. Now, reasonable notice is um, determined by certain factors such as uh, the age, the seniority or the length of service of the employee, the uniqueness of the role and the field of experience, and the job market and the likely re-employability of that employee. So you want to ensure that if you have a, an employee, um, uh, in the event of uh, termination, you set the, the time frame for the, the notice term. You don't want to um, be faced with a claim of nine, ten months pay where you provided that employee with one month's pay in lieu of notice uh, following um, dissatisfactory performance or unsatisfactory performance. Um, be aware, though, that uh, if there is an express notice term, that will almost always defeat any reasonable notice claim. So including that clause in the agreement will give you uh, almost a unviolable protection. And the reason why I'm dealing with this is because of a recent decision of Mar and Expeditors International Proprietary Limited. Now, uh, Ms Ma had been employed by Expeditors for a period of 24 years. She rose through the ranks from a uh, financial administrative assistant to financial controller for the entire Asia-Pacific region of um, the company. She was never subject to any formal contract of employment. She only received um, very basic general letters of employment uh, on a three- or four-year basis, and her most recent letter of employment um, only contained a notice term for her resignation. So it only, allowed, it only required her to give four weeks' notice of resignation but didn't specify the period of notice required to be give by, given by the employer if it wished to terminate her employment. There was an employment dispute after the employer wished to um, amend or, or issue with her with a new agreement, and they decided to pay her, uh, terminate her employment immediately and pay her five weeks in lieu of notice. She claimed uh, that the termination was a breach of the implied term of reasonable notice and uh, claimed um, a she, she asserted that the reasonable notice, given her length of service, her age, the uniqueness of her role and the specific skills she possessed, entitled her to a reasonable notice of 12 months. Uh, ultimately, uh, the Supreme Court found that 10 months' notice was reasonable and having regard to her very generous remuneration package, which was made up substantially of a bonus, received uh, 10 months' notice of 625000 plus a significant additional amount for um, Un, un, uh, untaken long service leave. Um, the total award paid to her as a result of the breach of contract was in the order of a million dollars, so it was a significant penalty for failing to have an express notice of termination clause in the agreement. Other benefits for employment agreements? Well, it minimises exposure representation claims. So ensure that um, whenever you make an offer of employment to an employee, that you um, ensure that it accords with any previous representations provided, but ensure that the employee was not subject to promissory language or statements that promised the moon prior to the employment contract um, that either couldn't be delivered um, in practice or weren't contained in the employment agreement. Uh, to avoid misrepresentation claims, don't make offers of employment at the interview. Make clear that the offer is limited to that contained in the employment agreement. 
and that any prior representations or discussions, negotiations are excluded. Require the employee to accept the offer by usually signing the contract or the letter of appointment and returning to you. Um, and as, as I said, um, limit um, or exclude pre-contractual negotiations from the terms and conditions of the employment agreement. Also be aware that under the Australian Consumer Law, uh, it's unlawful for an employer to um, engage in misleading or deceptive conduct during the negotiations for an employment agreement or for, for employment. And it's, um, it prohibits, uh, the, the Australian Consumer Law makes it unlawful to engage in deceptive or misleading conduct during the recruitment process. So ensure, ensure that whatever terms you're offering to an employee during negotiations or the recruitment process are those that you're uh, actually intending to offer uh, at the time that the employment agreement is offered or, or provided to the employer. Finally, uh, Employment agreements give you the benefit of requiring compliance with policies without incorporating them. Now, I, I mentioned, uh, I think a few times during the presentation, that policies should not form part of the actual employment agreement. The reason for that is set out in Goldman Sachs, um, J.B. Ware, Proprietary Limited, and Nikolich, which is a full court, federal court decision in 2007. And Mr. Nikolich was employed by Goldman Sachs as an investment advisor. He was given, at the commencement of his employment, he was given an employment agreement and a separate working with us policy. Uh, that policy contained uh, provisions relating to employee integrity, work health and safety, harassment and bullying, and grievance procedures. Now, Mr. Nikolic claimed that he was subject to bullying um, and harassment during his employment, which resulted in a, uh, a stress injury, and he claimed that Goldman Sachs failed to investigate his complaints which he made during employment or resolve those complaints in accordance with the policy requirements, the grievance procedure. Now, the court held that the policy and the terms of the policy form part of the contract. The reason for that was that Mr Nikolic was given the policy with his employment agreement and was told to become familiar with the policy terms. But most importantly, the employment contract did not specify that the, the employment contract did not specify that the po policy was not contractually binding on the employer. On the employer. As a result of those, um, uh, those um, failings by the employer, Mr Nikolic was awarded $500,000 in damages on the basis that Goldman failed to comply with its contractual obligation contained within the policy. So, in summary, what should you do? You should use your agreements as a shield and a sword. You should ensure that they protect your interests. You should ensure that they set out the terms and conditions that you specifically agree to and nothing more. You should ensure that they uh, avoid any uh, un, uh, inconsistency and liability under the Fair Work Act and specific awards. And you should ensure that they minimise any risks of breach of contract or misrepresentation claims. Um, you should use your employment contracts to uh, maximise the protections you have against um, competitive activity during and following employment by employees, so using post-employment restraints. Um, your contract should be used to protect your confidential information and your intellectual property. Um, if you follow those general principles and if your contracts uh, contain the provisions that we've set out earlier, then um, you should have a reasonably, uh, you should be really reasonably inoculated against claims and in the event that any claims do come, and they often do come regardless, you should be in a good position to be able to defend them. Um, that's all I had to say today. It was a quite a detailed presentation. Um, I am over, um, running over time. I do acknowledge that. I apologise for that if, if anyone has run out of time. Um, I'll just see if there's any questions uh, that anyone needs to ask. Um, okay. I have a question here that says, can I clarify whether it's necessary to issue an employee with a new employment agreement if their title or role changes? Does letter acknowledging the change, uh, including change in uh, remuneration, suffice? What would you advise? So thank you for the question. Um, our recommendation would be that in the event of a role change, um, it simply be, well, it depends on the nature of the, of the change. Uh, if it's a substantial variation uh, in duties uh, or position from uh, one type of role to another, 
for example, from clerical to manufacturing or from um, clerical to managerial, then we'd probably recommend that that be documented by way of a separate employment agreement. If it's just a, ch- a promotion uh, and an increase in responsibilities, that could probably be evidenced by a separate letter um, varying the terms. Um, but make sure that that variation letter specifies that the balance of the terms in the original employment agreement continue in full force. That will avoid uh, any argument that the, the, the variation letter um, replaces the former employment agreement and um, any missing terms no longer apply. So we would, uh, it would depend on the circumstances, but if it's a significant variation, we'd probably recommend that you um, uh, issue a new employment agreement. If it's a more modest variation, then you could probably get away with a written variation letter. Um, but also have regard to the fact that if your employment agreements um, do need a bit of tightening up, um, a promotion or a change in role would be a good opportunity to uh, provide an overhaul and um, uh, patch up any gaps you might have. Um, I'll have one more question before I think I run out of time completely. So uh, question is, is there any benefit in including leave clauses in an agreement if they are all regulated by legislation? So this one's... Um, uh, I, I've seen this approach in different ways. Um, our approach is to make reference to the main forms of leave um, that are commonly used by employees, that being annual leave, paid personal leave and long service leave. Uh, don't worry too much about things like community service leave, um, compassionate leave, things like that. Um, but you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You don't need to transcribe what those leave benefits are and you don't need to set out in detail uh, how leave is accrued, for example, or, or how leave is, is, is payable to an employee, for example. You don't need to say for a full-time employee they receive four weeks annual leave for each, um, for each year of service. Um, I would say it's sufficient to simply rely on um, and refer to um, the leave entitlements arising under any applicable industrial instrument. So you'd, you could you could provide a, a clause that said, um, under annual leave, for example, uh, you will receive annual leave in accordance with the applicable industrial instrument, but then you could go on and include any requirements, administrative requirements for the taking of that leave, such as giving of X number of uh, X number of weeks of notice in advance, or requiring the employee to take. Uh, leave at a period of, um, of clo- uh, annual close down, for example, the Christmas New Year break. Um, I don't think you need to restate exactly what the legislation sets out in respect to those leave benefits. Um, I think I have run out of time, everyone. Um, thank you for joining me today. Um, I do have these questions with me, so I will, um, uh, as long as I can identify you and, and there's a, an email address, I'll end- endeavour to respond to them uh, early next week. Uh, But if you have any other questions uh, for us, don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, We're available. Uh, Here are our contact details. We'd be happy to hear from you. And um, as I say, the takeaway is that um, uh, we strongly recommend uh, employment... uh, We strongly recommend legal advice or or legal review of employment agreements um, before implementation just to avoid the risk of anything um, um, uh, going wrong. So... uh, Thank you, everyone, and enjoy your day. Thank you.